day, brothers and sisters. I'd like to welcome you to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like and leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. Our lesson is coming from 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 12 through 20, and it's titled, Members of Christ. Membership is a great thing when we are members of the right thing. Membership comes with great benefits, but it cannot be abused or membership will suffer the penalties or the consequences doing things wrong or irrational. Today our lesson is going to show how our membership in the family of God liberates us from the law and how it allows the indwelling spirit of God to dwell in us if we avoid immorality and pursue holiness in all we do. Let's get into the lesson and see what it has to offer us today. Let's begin with verses 12 through 14. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meat for the belly, and the belly for meat. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will raise up us by his own power. Question 1 asks, how did Paul respond to the claim that all things are lawful? Paul says all things may be lawful, but they are not helpful. Just because it's legal to do something doesn't mean we should do it. Romans 6 verses 1 and 2 says, We shall say then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Sin is what separates us from God. It's damaging. And for the unredeemed, it is damning. For the Bible says in Romans 6 23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. See, Romans 6, verses 6 and 7 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who's died has been set free from sin. So again, shall sin abound in us? Shall grace abound that we may continue to sin on? Paul says a resounding in, in Romans 6 and 2, God forbid, we are bound by a higher calling. Our choices still have consequences. Yes, we are saved by grace, but as one sin, the consequences of that sin will still happen in our lives. Christian liberty is not an open excuse for any behavior or attitude. Paul is urging these Corinthians right here to live up to who they are now in Christ. Question two says, what was meant by the expression meat for belly and the belly for meats? This saying was said so people could satisfy all their cravings, whether it be food or immorality. Paul rejects the comparison and calls the Christians incarnate to live up to who they are now in Christ instead of lowering themselves to their earthly cravings. What is the future reality for food and stomach? They are temporary. God will destroy both. By these phrases, Paul is saying that we will die physically and stop eating food. Feeding our stomach is not the ultimate purpose of who we are. We do not live to eat. We eat to live. But we should not allow cravings, not just with food, but any craving that's of immorality or a sinful nature to get the best of us. See, the point is God does not free us from the power of sin to have us brought under the power again. Once we have been delivered from sin, we are delivered completely from that sin. We're delivered from the bondage of sin and the appetite of sin as well. Sin no longer has control over us. Question three says, how did Paul respond to this claim? He says, food is not eternal. Paul is saying God will destroy anything that is not eternal. We must cling to the things that are eternal. If it's not eternal, we don't need to lay hands on it. Paul elevates the importance of the bodies that we live in right now. See, the body is just much more than just a stomach, as we talked about. It's much more than just our sexual organs that cause us to go out and commit possibly sexual immorality. Our bodies serve a larger purpose for those who are in Christ. We're now meant to do things for God and elevate the principles and the manifestation of God in this life, not just to go in and please the flesh. See, at the end of the verse, Paul says that believer body is meant for the Lord. Even more amazing, the Lord is meant for the body of the believer. It's a place where he is with us. What we do with our bodies here and now matters far more than we may ever consider in this lifetime. See, God's people find ultimate fulfillment in pleasing him. We please God with our bodies, mind and soul. We live for God to please him in every way. The power that raised Christ from the dead is at work today to free every believer from the bondage of sin. We are raised to a relationship with our Heavenly Father. God's power completely frees us to be free from the stronghold of sin and the power of death. Death is not the only end to this physical body. 
we will one day be raised with Christ. And when we're raised with Christ, we no longer have the threat of death. We don't no longer have the threat of be becoming decayed and just riding away in the grave. No, we will rise with our eternal bodies and we will be with Christ someday. Verses 15 through 17 read, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that which is joined unto an harlot is one body? For two, he says, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Question four asks, what did Paul mean when he said we are members of Christ? To be a member of Christ means being united with him in relationship and fellowship. See, sin separates us from God. But the blood of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross allows us to unite back with the Lord God. It brings us into the family of God. And because we're in the family of God, we're united and have fellowship with him as well. Question five is, why did Paul ask the Corinthians, know ye not? In saying this, he's saying to the church, you already know better, but you're still allowing your flesh to get the best of you. It's just like when you grew up and mama said you knew better. Your friends might not know better, but you know better. Why? Because I taught you better than this. It's almost like them saying again, if you're going to let them come into your house, into your room and tear it up and mess it up, then you're going to suffer the consequences of cleaning it up. Paul is saying the children of Corinth, the believers of Corinth, they knew better. A child of God knows we cannot have our cake and eat it too. We know we are saved by grace, but we cannot allow the body to live any old kind of way and think it's okay. No, the Bible says we must subject our thoughts, subject our minds. We must bring this flesh under subjection as well. Because why? The flesh and the spirit, they fight on a daily basis. Question six asks, what picture did Paul use to demonstrate how reprehensible sexual sin was? It was impossible to think Christ would ever participate in a sexual activity with a prostitute. So it should be that same reprehension for the church to think how they could cheat on God. It would be wrong for us to think that we can go in and live out our lives with a prostitute and think that God would be okay with it. Question seven, what is meant by they shall be one flesh? This is saying there's a connection. The two shall become one. In Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So if we look at this spiritually, and our spiritual marriage to, to Jesus Christ, as we leave the sinful nature, as we leave that bondage that we were once in to the world, that controlling factor of that bondage, we are now to cleave to Christ as Christ as his bride. And as his bride, we are now one with him. And as we are one with him, we are connected and united with him. See, sexual immorality is acceptable in our culture, but it still offends God. We are one with him, and committing any immorality with God in us is a disgraceful thing. God will not have it. He will not share himself with any sin of any kind. Verse, let's read verses 18 through 20. It says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Question 8 says, How did Paul say we are to deal with sexual temptation? The only way to avoid sexual sin is to flee from it. Paul says you must run. You must run like Joseph ran when Potiphar's wife tried to hem him up. We must remove ourselves from the situation. See, if we stay too long, we'll do too much. And before you know it, you'll be wrapped up, tied up in sexual sin. So Paul says, run. Run for your life. Run as if your life depended on it. Run from sexual immorality. See, the point is sexual sin holds men and women in bondage. God desires that we be free. We cannot allow ourselves to be held in bondage anymore. Question nine says, why is sexual sin so much more damaging than other sins? Sexual sin is more damaging than other sins because of the ramifications. Paul shows that sexual immorality is different because it's a sin that it not only harms us, but it harms someone else as well. We might commit other sins with our bodies, but sexual immorality unites us sinfully with another person. This happens on a deeply physical and spiritual level. We will experience the natural consequences of that sin at a deep level as well. We cannot think that it is okay to be children of God and still go out and do things of the flesh. 
God is saying, God forbid. He said, God forbid in those verses above. Question 10 says, why can we not say that our bodies belong to ourselves? We have been bought with a price. We no longer own ourselves. Paul says that our bodies are really not ours anymore. They have been purchased by God. He paid for our bodies through redemption for the sin with the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ shed blood on the cross so that we could be free. And when he shed that blood, it was just like that lamb giving up his blood to set the person free in the Old Testament. Now, we in the New Testament are set free by the purchased blood of Jesus Christ. He gave his life as a ransom to redeem us. He became our true redeemer. See, God has paid the price for every believer, so we now must glorify him with our bodies. Christ bought our way out of the curse of living under the law of Moses by becoming that curse for us. We came to belong to Christ. Now that as we belong to him, we come to him by faith. And now that we come to him by faith in Jesus Christ, we no longer own our own bodies. Our bodies are now instruments and vessels that he may dwell in and use as he sees fit to go in and do the work that he has called us to do. We no longer own ourselves. See, yes, this concludes our lesson. I hope that you've enjoyed it. If so, leave us a comment or two. I do apologize for the tardiness. It has been a very busy two weeks for me. Please understand, I truly love doing the lessons, but other obligations sometimes will hinder it coming out on time. So please stay with me and work with me. If you haven't seen it out, just know that I am busy, busy, busy. Well, that's all for this week. Come back next week. Same time, same channel. Be blessed now.